almost evening. Uh, while we're talking here for a moment, the uh, scenario is changing behind you as walls disappear and uh, new seats emerge. So I appreciate uh, having uh, such a robust turnout for today's issues uh, opportunity. For those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I'm Don Betson. I have the honor of serving as president of the University of Central Oklahoma. And welcome to our campus. If you're one of, one of us, you know the story here, and welcome to you as well. Uh, we're very pleased uh, that you're here today and uh, continue to uh, look forward opportunities to serve the people, not just of Edmond, but of all of Oklahoma City and, and the state. Uh, every once in a while, we remind ourselves that we've been doing this since 1890 uh, as the Oklahoma Territorial Normal School and this commitment to quality opportunities for education obviously continues and we're very, very pleased uh, that you're here uh, to entertain and to welcome to uh, Edmund and to UCO a, a gentleman who I know is going to be uh, engaging you on subjects of, uh, of importance and, and great interest. Um, Lawrence Wilkerson is a visiting professor of government and public policy at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. He asked me to refer to him as Larry, so I will do that appropriately now that I got the Lawrence in, right? He also has taught for six years at the University Honors Program at George Washington University in Washington, DC. His last position in government, uh, his positions in government were as um, Secretary of State Colin Powell's Chief of Staff, Associate Director of State Department's Policy Planning Staff under the directorship of Ambassador Richard Haas, who now directs the Foreign Policy Association, and a member of that staff responsible for East the Pacific political, military, and legislative affairs. Before serving at the State Department, Larry served 31 years in the U.S. Army, including as a deputy executive officer to then General Colin Powell when he commanded the U.S. Armed Forces Command, special assistant to General Powell when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and as director and deputy director of the United States Marine Corps War College at Quantico, Virginia. Uh, when he retired from active service in 1997, he then worked as advisor to General Powell, and since leaving the State Department, he has spoken virtually to all kinds of groups across America, world affairs councils, universities, war colleges, members of state and local government, the U.S. Congress, uh, and their staffs. In addition, you might have caught one of his articles in a variety of, of formats, Los Angeles Times, the Baltimore Sun, the Miami Herald, New York Daily News, etc. If you're a fan of television, you might have seen him also on anything from Wolf Blitzer, and BBC's Hard Talk, and Newsnight, and Stephen Colbert. He also appeared recently in a number of documentaries. Today, we're so pleased to welcome to University of Central Oklahoma and to Oklahoma, uh, Colonel Larry Wilkerson, addressing the issue, US and Iran, we need not be enemies. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Colonel Wilkerson. to get, can you hear me all right? Okay, good. Um, first of all, let me say that I haven't been back in Oklahoma for almost 43, 44 years. I used to fly helicopters across your deserts <laughs> out of places like Mineral Wells, Texas, which used to be the primary helicopter training center for the Army during the Vietnam conflict. And we used to do cross countries up here to Fort Sill and Walton and so forth. It really has changed, <laughs> and Oklahoma City in particular has changed. Um, I listened to your very dynamic mayor today at a Rotary luncheon downtown, and I was amazed uh, at not just his command of his brief, but also the fact that Mohammed and Jalal, my host here, were telling me about how you have had good leadership through at least two, maybe three mayors which is incredible that we get good leadership on a continuous basis in our democratic federal republic these days. So you are to be commended as voters, as concerned citizens, and everything else that goes into democracy, real democracy, for making sure your leadership is good. I would just point out that there's a country in the world right now that has had that happen to it 
that you should all be alert to, especially you in the business world, in the future, and that is Brazil. It had eight years of Lula, and now it has another President Rousseff, Dilma Rousseff, who looks a lot like a Lula clone. And I will tell you that when I got out of a taxi in Sao Paulo, Brazil, two months from Lula's end of his eight-year term, the taxi driver turned to me, and in English, not Portuguese, said, you ever see a president leave with 80% in the polls? And that's what Lula left the presidency with, an 80% standing in the polls in Brazil. And I will tell you, Brazil is a different country today because of that leadership. A country to be reckoned with, a country growing, and a country that is going to be the leader of at least half of the Western Hemisphere, no question about it. Why would I want to come to you tonight and say something about Iran? It's important that I deliver a message to every audience I can encounter across this great country about Iran and in other places too, like France and the United Kingdom, Germany, and so forth. I came here because I was a speaker at a NIAC council in Washington. NIAC is the uh, National American Iranian Council. It is an attempt by Iranian Americans, if you will, to build the same kind of political power that other groups have like the NRA and like the old people's group that I keep refusing to belong to. I think they call it the AARP or something like that. I'm not old, I keep telling them. They keep sending me letters. And I met uh, my host here, my very gracious host, uh, Jalal Muhammad of Home Creations. I'm sure you all know them probably. Um, I met them at this council and they asked me to come out here. And I must say that the hospitality so far has been absolutely superb. Uh, President Betts and I met at the Rotary Luncheon today, and I want to thank him and also thank Jalal and Muhammad and everyone else who had a hand in putting this together because everything so far has just told me I should come to Oklahoma more often. But why would I want to talk again about Iran and the U.S.? Because it is arguably right now staring us in the face as another potential war in Western Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, you should be, and I know I am, weary of war in Western Asia. Weary, really weary. Not just morally and realpolitik wise, but also physically. We have just spent somewhere close to $4 trillion of your hard-earned taxpayer dollars to wage conflict in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in the so-called worldwide global war on terror for the past 10, 12, 13 years. And frankly, we don't have a whole lot to show for it, not in real terms. You could say, well, we haven't had another terrorist attack. And the reason for that is because we've spread our GIs across the globe and put red targets on their backs and let people that are affiliated with or are Al-Qaeda fight them and kill them. And I can tell you as a soldier that I'm a little bit alarmed at the prospect that a nation of 311 million people would put less than 1% of its entire population onto the battlefield to bleed and die and come home with traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder and a host of other maladies and be committing suicide in your land forces at astronomical rates. Army and Marine Corps have never seen anything like this. You wonder why we just made a decision to let women serve in the combat arms? Forget about egalitarianism. We can't recruit enough good men. And frankly, women make the best soldiers. Women do not go AWOL. They do not have non-judicial punishment. They do not have judicial punishment. They are not promiscuous. They do not start fights. Women are the best soldiers. This has nothing to do with egalitarianism and everything to do with the fact that we have a volunteer military, not a draft military, and therefore we have to recruit women in great numbers. 
One of the reasons the suicide rate is off the charts is because for the past three or four years, we have been recruiting men in the Marine, Marines in the Army who probably shouldn't be there in the first place. No one's going to tell you that. Not General Martin Dempsey, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, not the Commander in Chief and President, not anyone in the Congress is going to tell you that. But I'm going to tell you that. Iran looms right now because of what we have done in terms of diplomatic statements, political statements, and financial and economic actions in the world as almost an inevitable another war in Western Asia. Why? Because the President has said it is unacceptable that Iran possess a nuclear capability not a nuclear weapon, a nuclear capability. Frankly, they already possess a nuclear capability. Second, that all options are on the table to counter this capability. That means the military option is on the table. And third, that his current course of action is diplomacy, implicating or indicating that you know, we're working diplomatically to solve the problem so we don't have to pull the other option off the table, the military. Well, right now, our diplomacy is sanctions. That's it. It's sanctions. As the Secretary of State said before she left, ever more crippling sanctions. Sanctions that are indeed so crippling and so artfully crafted, bringing in much of the world to enforce them, that they now are doing what sanctions did in Iraq prior to the second Iraq war. They are hurting Iranian children, sick people in hospitals, hurting the Iranian people who, by and large, still don't look on the United States as an enemy. In fact, still, in some respects, envious. In other respects, are basically friends with us. I'm not talking about the government. I'm talking about the Iranian people. 51% of whom, unlike most of that other polyglot mixture in that region of the world, are Persian. That is to say, they have a very cohesive national feeling about themselves. And so it's a very different entity. It's not a British-constructed potentate. It's not a border drawn where no one would have drawn a border had they known anything about the peoples, like Pakistan and Afghanistan, for example. It's a real country. In fact, if you know your history, you know that the real threat in the Mediterranean when the Spartans and the Athenians were fighting each other over who would be the hegemon in the, in the Mediterranean, the Persians were the real enemy. <laughs> and eventually the Greeks had to fight the Persians to a fairly well to finally come out in some meaningful economic and political state. So this is an ancient empire that we're talking about, an ancient country with an ancient feeling of nationalism. Now let's back up just a moment. In 1971, late 70 and 71, when I was flying those helicopters I was just describing to you in my opening remarks, I was training Iranians. I was training Vietnamese. I was training Yemenis. I was training Iraqis. I was training all manner of people who were our friends and allies around the world to include the region of the Persian Gulf. Why was I doing that? I was doing that because we recognized at that time, as we had for some years, that in terms of real military significance, population significance, demographic significance, geographic significance, the power in the Persian Gulf was Iran. We recognized that. We overthrew, in a coup, MI6 and the CIA, Kermit Roosevelt and the CIA leading the way. We overthrew the first democratically elected leader of Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh, because we were fearful that he would do what he was doing to the British and jack up oil prices, nationalize the oil, and so forth and so on. So we decided we'd get rid of him, and we installed the Shah in his place, who became a tyrant, but our tyrant. And so we had 26 years of relative stability in the Gulf. And you can argue whether or not that was a good decision, good policy or not, but it did buy 26 years of stability. And if you look at it really closely, it bought 
the end of the Marshall Plan and the recovery in Europe because of the cheap oil. So Eisenhower is, I don't blame him too badly for having done that, but I do look back and say you've got to understand this history in order to understand the current relationship we have with Iran. So we put a tyrant in there for 26 years, and oh, by the way, our CIA helped him train his most tyrannical instrument, the SAVAK, the secret police, in order to repress his people. And then they threw him out. They threw him out. They being the Iranians, they threw him out. You, you probably know about how they did that and why and what it did to our president at the time, President Carter, 444 days of hostages and so forth, and really, really soured relations between Iran and the United States. And yet, something we only know now after studying the archives and looking more closely at some of the cables that came in at the time that we disregarded, that revolution was really a revolution of many elements in Iran. It was the business people. It was the people who were the descendants of Mossadegh, the Democrats, the progressives, the liberals, if you will, in our terminology. It was all kinds of elements, including the radical mullahs which is the term we like to use today to describe the ayatollahs that wound up consolidating the revolution. So at, at any time during that period, any one of those segments could have probably consolidated that revolution had they been a little smarter, but they didn't, the radical mullahs did. And incidentally, if you want to look at the hostage taking in that regard, you'll find that hostages were taken around Valentine's in February. And the Ayatollah immediately ordered the students to release the hostages because he had not consolidated his revolution yet. And then, of course, in November, when the hostages were taken that we're talking about and we know most about, he ordered the students to keep the hostages because then he'd consolidated his revolution, was in charge, he felt, and could use that to establish his bona fides as the new leader of the radical Islamic world. And we missed all of that. We were too busy listening to Henry Kissinger and David Rockefeller advise Jimmy Carter, who was indisposed to do it, but nonetheless wound up doing it, letting the Shah come into our country for medical treatment. And of course, that did it with the Iranian people, at least the ones who were surrounding the hostages. And we didn't get our hostages back for 444 days. And so that deepened the mistrust, the distrust, and the sourness between us, but didn't change the reality of who Iran is in the Persian Gulf. Demographically, geographically, national cohesion, militarily, they're still the same people. I'm in New York City, and I'm in a hotel with a number of State Department people and a couple of people from our military, and I'm meeting with Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Ooh, the bait noir the beast of Iran. And I'm, my intervention with him is on the situation in the Gulf. I wanted to make sure that he understood how dangerous the situation in the Gulf was. This is back in September when he was in New York for the UN General Assembly. So I gave him my five minutes worth of how dangerous it was and we needed an incidents at sea agreement. We needed this agreement that we had with the Soviets throughout the Cold War because we wanted to prevent an incident in the Gulf between the navies. And after I finished my spiel, into my ear comes, because he's speaking only Farsi through his translator, comes the following comment. Iran has 1,100 kilometers on the Persian Gulf. The United States does not have an inch. Who's the security problem? Really made his point. And guess what happened after that? Well, your Navy, being smart, and I trained and educated with them for seven years, so I can testify to that, decided that Washington essentially didn't matter anymore and went ahead and effected an incident at sea agreement on the sea in the Persian Gulf with the Iranians. And so for all practical purposes, thank the good Lord, we have an agreement right now between the Iranian warships and other accoutrements of their military and ours that means we can communicate in the event of an emergency. And so we haven't had an incident. And I hope that we won't have one because these two navies are professional and they know how to deal with one another and they don't want a war, neither one of them. 
want to war. Showing how if you really think about the realities of the power equation, you can deal with your enemy. How would you elevate that? We've already been given a deal twice. You say you're negotiating, Mr. President, in good faith. We've already been given a deal twice, once by the Russians, and then a second time by the Brazilians, that nation I spoke of, and the Turks. The deal is a win-win deal. The deal is very simple. It's Iran doesn't enrich above 3%, that which it has enriched above 3%, up to 20, is scooted out of the country under safeguards. The IAEA stays around under the additional protocol and the safeguards agreement intrusively for five to seven years, whatever's agreed to, and makes sure that Iran doesn't enrich any further than three to 5%. And once that's established and there's some trust between both sides and between Vienna, and the IAEA in Iran too, and Iran has come clean on some of the past practices that it probably hasn't quite come clean on yet, then we have a whole new deal. We have a civilian nuclear program that looks like anybody else's civilian nuclear program. We have contracts to sell Iran the highly enriched or more highly enriched uranium, up to 20%, that they need for medical treatment and so forth. And we have a rigorous inspection regime on the ground, and the non-proliferation treaty is working, and Iran is a member of the international community and recognized as such and has a civilian nuclear program, and we are all happy and go back offshore with our Navy and Marine amphibious groups and are ready to balance power in the Gulf the way we should be, not with boots on the ground anywhere, but with naval and air power offshore, far less expensive and far less, far less a recruiting tool for people like Aman al-Zawahiri, now in charge of al-Qaeda. It's so simple. The win-win solution is so simple, but why don't we get to it? Why don't we get to it? Well, let me back up for a minute. Let me tell you what it's like in Washington right now. A year ago, I got a call from the Friends Committee for National Legislation, the Quakers. What the hell do the Quakers want with me? <laughs> So I go over. I know they're a pretty good lobby group, so I go over. We really want to work on that Inc. C agreement I mentioned earlier. We want you to go to the Hill because you have the bona fides. You're no lobbyist. You're not taking money. We want you to go to the Hill and meet with every senator and their staff that we can arrange and every representative and their staff that we can arrange and talk about an Inc. C agreement. The Pentagon is working on a feasibility study and we want you to go over and persuade these people that we need an Inc. C agreement. So I go over and I talk to Democrats, Republicans, one independent, a host of Tea Party people, their staff, their staff's more important than the members because the members are raising money all the time and the staff's doing the work. You know, when I came to Washington first, there were 10,000 staffers, there's 26,000 now. Talk about a bureaucracy growing. But part of that is because the member's all the time raising money and going to his home state largely to do that sometimes, and the staff does all the work. So I'm talking to these people. And the first thing I encounter, almost in the, well, it was in the very first senator's office. They don't want to just talk about an Inc. C, that's okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll co-sponsor, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. They want to talk about U.S. Iran, and they wanted my views. And so what I discovered as I talked about U.S. and Iran and gave them my views was how little political space there was in the Congress for any maneuver at all. And I can give you a one-word answer as to why. The one-word answer is Israel. No one in that Senate or that House was willing to make a decision or even talk about a strategic situation that was going to lead the United States into another catastrophic war in Western Asia because of Israel. That's a heck of a kettle of fish if you think about it for a minute. George Washington put it down very early in our life. No two nations ever have consistent congruent national interests. 
And any nation that gets so enshrouded by another nation's national interest is in trouble. Now, I'm a big fan of Israel. I've trained with IDF soldiers. I've helicoptered with them. I've ground fought with them. I've done things with them that I probably haven't done with other allies. I admire them greatly, and I want Israel's future to be secure, but it is not made secure by having the great power in the world linked to it so hard that that great power can't even make decisions on its own when those decisions impact that little country in the Middle East. It's that, I mean, I'm, I'm a realist. You just can't do business that way. So I began to have another set of meetings, and I began to probe that and probe that and probe that in the Senate Banking Committee, in the Senate Armed Services Committee, in the House Armed Services Committee. Everywhere I could go, I probed that. And what I got, essentially, when I got people to really tell me the truth was this, basically. I know what you're saying. I know the reality of what you're saying. And I understand that the long-term security of Israel is probably secured in a better way where you would think more realistically about these things. I mean, after all, let's just examine it for a minute. Every fifth Israeli now is a settler. The political constituency in Tel Aviv is such that it has to represent those people. One of the most active constituencies for Bibi Netanyahu is the Orthodox Jews who will not even serve and shed their blood in the military but constitute a very, very violent element within the settlers. So he doesn't have much choice if he's going to stay in office. He's got to be this sort of advocate for Iran being an existential threat to Israel, for Iran being this, that, and the other thing, and for bringing the United States in to bear because Israel simply can't do it by itself. This is an untenable strategic situation. If Israel bombed Iran tomorrow morning, they would make the rocks bounce. They would kill a few innocent civilians and maybe a few nuclear physicists and others and do a little damage, but they simply don't have the capacity. They do not have the military capacity to do the kind of damage that we could do, and they know that, and so they are assuming that we'll follow them. And from what I saw on the Hill, in the Senate and in the House, we probably will. Round the clock, four carrier battle groups, 24-7, four or five weeks of the most intense air campaign you've seen since Iraq. And yes, we'll do a lot of damage. We'll do a heck of a lot of damage and kill a lot of people, innocent and guilty. We will kill a lot of people. And guess what? They will throw the IAEA out, and their cameras will come out, they will go deeper underground, and they will make a decision on the spot to nuclearize, and they will nuclearize. So where are you then? Follow me. Then you must invade. Then you must go put your Marines and your soldiers onto Iranian soil, change the regime, root out the nuclear capability, Stay there at least eight or ten years. Spend at least two to four trillion dollars. And fritter away more of your real power on the periphery of your empire in a essentially unsuccessful attempt to consolidate that empire. That's what we're about. This is not a tenable position for the United States to be in. And yet, I cannot tell you how we are going to extricate ourselves from it, except by serendipity. That is to say, somebody else does something. Where is the most likely spot for that to happen tomorrow morning, and it might not be a good serendipity? What's happening in Syria right now? Defying all the pundits in Washington, Bashar al-Assad is holding on. He's holding on, if you know anything about Syria, because Syria is not these other countries. In fact, none of these other countries in the so-called Arab Spring is these other countries. They're all different. Every one of them is different. Morocco's different. Tunisia's different. Egypt's different. Syria's different. Bahrain's different. They're all different. So he's holding on, and probably, even if he were to die tomorrow morning or, or go to his Swiss chalet or wherever he wants to go, 
we'd still have the contingent of Alawites and others who are around him right now fighting tooth and nail to hold on to their power, and much of Syria on their side still, not to mention the Chinese and the Russians. So how are you going to use Syria, Senator McCain, Senator Graham? Well, we're going to use it as a back door into Iran. And there are people seriously thinking about that in Washington right now. How do we get into Iran by the back door? We go into Syria first. You know, we have to, oh, it's so bad in Syria. There's so many people dying, and that's true, and it's tragic. We're going to have to go in on the ground, and when we go in on the ground, guess who we're going to confront? We're going to confront the Iranians, because the Iranians are in Syria. They're giving Syria political support. They're giving them logistic support. They may even be giving them soldier support. They're there. Back door. Damascus first, and then Tehran. Well, add five more years to that projection of time I gave you, and another trillion dollars, and wow, we are really in a mess. Really in a mess. And yet, you come back to the solution, and the solution is exactly what the president has said it is, but is not very earnest about, and that's diplomatic. You always have the instrument in your back pocket if it does truly become an existential threat. I can't see how it could. But you do have that instrument in your back pocket if, as a last resort, you have to use it. So why use it up front? Why go in with the military as your leading card? Now, trust is the real ingredient we're talking about here. How do you rebuild trust between two countries that have just sort of done it to each other? And, and how do I mean do it to each other, besides overthrow Mossadegh in 53, install the Shah, so forth and so on? Well, we supported Iraq in the eight-year bloody Iraq-Iran war. We did. Look at the documents, as I have. We supported them. President Reagan actually denied to the American people that Saddam Hussein had used chemical weapons against his own people in Halabja. You can say President Reagan wasn't well informed, or you can say President Reagan was lying to the American people. I don't know. Take your choice. I'm a Republican. President Reagan is one of my heroes, but that wasn't one of his stellar moments. We took Iraq's side in that war. We also made Iraq think twice about our fidelity to being on their side because we sold tow missiles and Hawk missiles to Iran and transferred the money we gained from that through the Israelis over to fund the Contras against the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. Ooh, what a perfidious government we have. We did all of this. So here is Saddam Hussein saying, I thought you were on our side. As a matter of fact, after he found out about Iran-Contra, when it broke into the papers, he threw all the CIA out of Baghdad. He said, you perfidious people, get out of here. Yeah. Point being that Iran has a reason to distrust us as well as we have a reason to distrust them. We have ample reason to distrust them. The way you do something about that is you have to begin to build some empathy. You have to begin to put yourself in the other person's shoes and that person has to put himself in your shoes. And you have to think about this really hard. You can't do that if your policy is your diplomats cannot talk to an Iranian upon pain of death. I mean, that's essentially what Hillary told the State Department. You can't talk to an Iranian. I've been trying to go to Iran for almost six months. I can't even get a visa. That's not the way to treat your enemies or even your potential friends, you need to talk to them. Dwight Eisenhower would never buy this. George Washington would never buy this. No president who ever made our pedestal would ever buy this kind of treatment of other people in the world. We need to talk to people. You don't put your gun down. You still got it. I mean, if you have to use it, you use it. But you do start by talking. And you build trust in that talking, and maybe eventually you get to a point where you actually can achieve something. And that achievement would be quite simple, as I described it. It's not rocket science. It's really easy to get to that point. Here's why I think 
all the things I'm saying are just so many words in a paper hat. What the struggle about in the Persian Gulf that I alluded to earlier is not nuclear weapons. That's a subterfuge. What the struggle is about is power. The struggle is about who shall be the regional boss in the Persian Gulf. Saudi Arabia and its acolytes in the Gulf Cooperation Council, of course, allied with us, want to be. Israel, though it is distant from that area, militarily speaking, wants to be. Iran wants to be. The United States wants to be able to play with whichever hegemon wins and fulfill its interests. How in the devil, if that's the real situation in the Gulf, all about power, which is incidentally usually the real situation in the world, do we ever extricate ourselves or our friends, Israel, from that mess? I come back to my original formulation. The first thing you've got to do, if you're the great power, if you're the power that can bring pressure and influence to bear on any one of those parties, is you've got to talk to all of them. Not just the Saudis, not just the Israelis, not just the Turks in Ankara. You've got to talk to the Persians in Tehran. And you've got to build some kind of trust in that talk. And one of the ways to do that would be to, instead of spurning these offers of good offices from Turkey, from Brazil, is to accept them. And to say to Ankara, for example, I know one of the reasons Iran is busting the sanctions right now and some of the elements I don't want to empower in Iran are getting really rich over this, as often happens with sanctions. I know one of the reasons is because natural gas and oil is going through Turkey in exchange for gold. And I know that the sale of oil and gas in that particular area surpasses pre-sanction times. So that money's not going to the Iranian people, though. That money's going into the pockets of a few individuals who are getting very rich in both Turkey and Iran. You need to get all these parties involved and get them interested in a solution that will allow them to make money and continue their commerce, of course, but on a more legitimate basis, on a more open and transparent basis, and on a basis that ultimately helps solidify and solve the big problems in the region. You only do this through talking. You only do this through talking. In Afghanistan, right after we had conducted our operations that essentially rooted the Taliban out, sent them scurrying to the mountains, rooted Al-Qaeda out, sent them scurrying to Tora Bora, we actually talked with the Iranians. Ambassador James Dobbins was sending cables back to me and to Secretary Powell and the State Department and we were talking to the Iranians. We had gotten rid of their number two enemy. Their number one enemy, of course, was Saddam Hussein. Little did they know at that time we were gonna get rid of him too. But we had gotten rid of the Taliban. We forget the Taliban were a big enemy of the Iranians, had murdered some of their diplomats inside Afghanistan. So we got rid of them for them. They were happy about that. We were working together. We were actually tactically on the ground working together, sharing intelligence, they were helping us with some areas along the border that we didn't know much about, that they knew a lot about after all they lived there. And it was going quite well. And then all of a sudden, my president gave a speech that called them a member of the axis of evil. And I know you will love this one. The president didn't put those words in his speech. His speechwriter did, because he thought they were lyrical. And he wanted to rival Ronald Reagan's speech where he said the evil empire with respect to the Soviet Union. I know because the guy told me that. So here we go. We've got good relationships, tactically speaking, developing on the ground in Afghanistan. And the president gives a speech and the Iranians are like, well, my God, if we're a member of the axis of evil, then why are we cooperating in Afghanistan? And we missed a marvelous opportunity to take that tactical cooperation and elevate it into more issues, into more problems and more challenges and try to solve some of them. Same thing happened when we toppled the statue in Baghdad. 
granted, the Iranians were probably pretty fearful. We did that really fast, if you recall. Here's Saddam Hussein in a hole somewhere, hiding. The former tyrant, the former, you know, firer of rifles in the square. He's in a hole hiding and growing a long beard. Well, the Iranians were scared. So what did they do? They sent us a non-paper. A non-paper is a diplomatic note that has no indicia on it and no signature on it. That is to say, you can't identify where it came from, but you know where it came from because it came from Iran to our protecting power in Tehran, the Swiss, to Geneva, our ambassador in Geneva, and to us at the State Department, and to Condi Rice at the National Security Council. And it said, oh, hey, Americans, look, we got your note, because we'd given them a non-paper when we were cooperating in Afghanistan, which told them what we wanted to talk about. We got your note, and here's our note in response. And their note said, yeah, we'll talk about these, but not these, and this is what we want to talk about. Give us a response. And our response was, hmm, screw you. Our response was, we've just had a heady victory in Iraq. We're going to get you next, maybe through Damascus, so we don't have to worry about it. Ha, they're scared to death. Let's don't talk to them. It's not a serious offer. And I'm sad to say, I'm sad to say that even the State Department, Bill Burns, Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs, and my boss, Secretary Powell, more or less took that approach with Condi and with the President. Other people were saying, no, this might be a serious offer. What have we got to lose? What have we got to lose? If it's not a serious offer, there's no, no, not going to be any egg on anybody's face because nobody knows about it. We should follow up. Eh, we're not going to follow up. So we missed that opportunity. And frankly, there have been a couple of more opportunities, not quite as potentially successful building as those, but other opportunities since then. And either because of intransigence in Tehran or intransigence in Washington, we haven't availed ourselves of those opportunities. It's time we changed our whole approach. It's time we changed it to what? Well, we have got to say to the Iranians, unlike we did this last time when we were trying to talk, we've got to say to them something besides aircraft parts. Aircraft parts. My God, we sold them the aircraft a long time ago. We should have been giving them aircraft parts for civilian airliners in particular. But we're going to give them aircraft parts. No, that's not a quid pro quo for their doing all the things we want them to do. A quid pro quo would be some kind of relief on the EU oil embargo and probably some kind of relief on the banking sanctions. If we put those on the table, we don't have to put them there forever. And people say, well, no, boy, if you relax them at all, then you won't be able to get the other people together again. Well, they weren't very effective, if that's the truth. You've got to be able to put a quid, quo, a quid pro quo on the table. You've got to be able to put something down the Iranians want. And then they've got to put something down we want, which is, as I just described to you, we want them to not have anything but a civilian nuclear program very intrusively inspected for at least five to seven years and very carefully observed by the international community as well as by us. That's achievable that because of all of the things that I've described to hear you here tonight about realpolitik and power and so forth and so on, I am really doubtful it's going to happen. So I guess what my bottom line is, is very, very sad. And that is that we are apt to go into a bombing campaign in the next 24 to 36 months that will be unsuccessful, in fact will create the exact opposite effect of what we want, and then we'll wind up with an invasion. And all I can hope is that the Army and the Marine Corps and other elements of our military are able to recover enough between now and then that it won't be the disaster that I think it might be. Final note. In a conversation with both FBI and CIA people who ought to know, recently in Washington. A question was asked of one of the CIA individuals who has been very deeply and profoundly involved with Afghanistan ever since the Mujahideen and our support for them against the Soviets, long time. And he was asked just how many suicide bombers did he think were being recruited and trained in the federally administered tribal areas and adjacent areas in Afghanistan 
of Pakistan. And he looked at the rest of us and sort of grimaced and said probably somewhere around 30 to 40,000. And those are going to be unleashed on the world? Well, they're going to be sent to places around the world and they're going to be hope, they're going to hope they being the people who are training them they're going to hope that they will carry out their mission knowing that probably maybe 3 in 10 will actually do it that's still a lot of people who have an interest in damaging us values wherever they might be in turkey in egypt in morocco in tunisia indeed even in the united states although one of the things we have going in our favor is that we've got two big oceans and a rough trail in Mexico and a rough trail in Canada now and there's a target rich environment out there without having to go through that kind of travail for anyone wanting to perpetrate a terrorist act that is to say there's plenty of Americans around the world particularly in uniform uh, to attack so is, th does that increase the likelihood of an attack in the United States? I don't know. I really don't know how to answer that question. And he was very candid and said he didn't know how to answer it either. But it does tell you that Donald Rumsfeld was right in 2004 when he turned to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and to some of his civilian personnel and he said, tell me how if every time we kill a terrorist and we create 10 more, we're winning. That math doesn't work very well if you're killing one and creating 10. And I'm afraid that what the CIA gentleman was saying and what others were corroborating was that what we're doing around the world right now, our actions around the world right now, are helping to recruit people at a rate faster than we're killing them. And that simply doesn't work out. Your questions. Yes. 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 Um, there's a book coming out of American University by one of the leading anthropologists who himself has the bona fides of having been a provincial government official in Waziristan, of all places, a successful one probably one of the few. Um, it's called a Thistle and the Drone. I recommend it to all of you. Um, it, he essentially shows how our drone attacks around the world are not only decimating tribal communities around the world, culturally, religious-wise, and so forth. Um, and this is, this is a much bigger tapestry than we've been led to believe by the American press. Um, let me give you an example. We just got an airfield to fly drones out of in northwest Niger. We offered Niger a lot of economic goodies and they gave us the position to put our drones and so now we're going to be flying them over Mali, Algeria, and probably Libya and maybe elsewhere. Um, this is, bottom line is we probably are doing just what Rumsfeld said. We're probably creating at least as many as we're killing and probably more. People who are antagonistic to our interests, whether it be in the Maghreb, or whether it be in the Middle East or South, uh, South Asia or wherever. Um, and this is largely because of the incredible increase that this administration has made in terms of drone strikes. Uh, I heard a figure the other day that's probably somewhat accurate, 30 times as many drone strikes un under this administration as under the previous one. There's another problem to this too. We have not developed any ethics, a general code of ethics if you will, nor law, international or domestic, about use of these things, the technology has gotten way ahead of us in terms of law and ethics. I had a military officer tell me not too long ago that he really had significant problems with being totally invulnerable and yet killing other people. Also had a senior master sergeant in the Air Force at the Bethesda Medical Complex tell me that there's a significant group of PTSD people coming in associated with drones now. Well, that's, that's understandable if, if you know anything about the warrior ethos, to be totally invulnerable and yet be killing people, civilians as well, because there's collateral damage often with these strikes, um, wears on you. 
My son right now is in the Tennessee Air National Guard. He's a C-130 pilot, and he has been designated to be one of the first drone squadron commanders in the Air National Guard, and he's going to start, well, he's actually already started his training. You're going to have about 14 months of training on active duty, and then go back and stand up a drone squadron in the Air National Guard. He's conflicted over it, as are a lot of his colleagues. Uh, this, is, this is not what you sign up for. <laughs> Um, there's a great article. If you don't believe this, read this article by Jason Armagas. It's called What to Pack on the Way to Baghdad. It's a wonderful article, and if you're a military guy or, you had, or gal, if you had any experience in the military, you know what Jason's talking about. He's flying a B-2 bomber the opening day of the war with Iraq with two 2,000-pound satellite-guided bombs, and he's reading Homer and Virgil and Seneca and these other writers, St. Thomas Aquinas, on the way to Baghdad because that's what you do when you fly 20 straight hours straight and level. And he's talking to himself in this article about what it does to the warrior ethos to be invulnerable. And you as a citizen would probably say, that's what I want. I want my guys and gals to be invulnerable and kill the enemy. But that's not the warrior ethos, not from King Henry V to the present or probably before Henry V. The warrior ethos is the ethos of my infantry and the marine infantry. I'm bigger and better, and I've got a cause that's superior to yours, but I'm going to fight you. I'm going to fight you in your face, and I'm going to kill you. That's not always the perfect way it resolves itself, but that's the warrior ethos. So to be up there in that plane and being vulnerable and dropping this bomb and killing several hundred people is a really dicey thing psychologically. We haven't considered that either. That's another component of this new technology, where the technology is coming on so fast, we don't let sound, sane people sit down and talk about it in legal terms. Look at all the international borders we've violated. Look at all the air defense identification zones. We put five Cubans in jail, right, for shooting down Jose Basulto's Brothers to the Rescue aircraft that had been harassing Cuba for six or seven months. We put Ger uh, Gerardo in jail for two life sentences plus 15 years. We're doing that every day now with our drones. They're not manned, but we're crossing international boundaries without the permission of the international bounded countries and killing people in those countries. There's no law. There's no ethics. There's nothing associated with it. And I, I tell people, you know, wait until they're flying over Times Square. And people look back at me and they say, oh, no, no, no one will ever get that technology. Man, don't do much history, do you? Every technology man has ever come up with is countered and or duplicated by someone else within six months. Chinese are working on arming theirs right now. Are they going to fly one over Times Square? Wait and see. Might happen in my lifetime. Are they going to fly one over the South China Sea when a Philippine fisherman is moving into some part of the Spratleys that the Chinese claim and don't want the Filipinos there and zap him from 30,000 feet up? I don't know. What are we going to do when they do? Are we going to protest at the United Nations? Are we going to go to war with China? There are other people in the world who have this technology. So let's start developing the kind of ethics and law that ought to go along with the use of this technology. No, we just continue to use it. Other questions? Yes. Did I support him? Um, I prepared him. I spent five, I spent five days and five nights at Langley, um, in prison with George Tennant and John McLaughlin, and the rest of the intelligence community, and two nights and a day in New York in prison with the same characters, and I was responsible for it, at least in terms of putting it together. Not at all. As I've said before, it was the lowest day in my professional and personal life because we perpetrated a hoax on the American people, on the foreign community we were speaking to, and on the UN Security Council. We didn't know we were doing it, but that's no excuse. Yes. Mubarak, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, it's an interesting question. It, 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 the question is, what about our going ahead and selling M1 Abrams tank, state-of-the-art 60-ton tank, to the new Morsi uh, ruler in Egypt uh, because it was a commitment to Mubarak beforehand? Um, there are so many implications to <laughs> what I might call nefarious things there. First of all, we have to keep the, we, we, we have made a decision, we have to keep the Abrams production line warm. And you don't keep the production line warm when you've got $60 billion worth in northern Alabama you're trying to repair from your own fracas in Iraq and so forth. So you gotta, you got to do some foreign military sales. And it's probably, if you've got to do some, it's probably better to give them to Egypt than some other characters out there that we might want to give them to. So that's part of it. Another part of it is we are still trying to ensure that the most important peace accomplishment with regard to the uh, almost intransigent problem with the Palestinians and the Israelis in the wider Arab world, Camp David, uh, stays intact. Because Israel's most vulnerable area, her rear, if you will, has been at peace because of Egypt. Um, if that were suddenly to become not a reality anymore, if Egypt were suddenly to become I Israel's enemy, um, we'd have a real problem. And, and we're trying to keep them on our side, so to speak. We're trying to keep them on the peace treaty side, the peace agreement side, so to speak. You could say, well, don't be giving them more arms. <laughs> um, I think the Israelis would say and have said in private, no big deal. Not like the F-15s you sold to Saudi Arabia. This, this is not a really big deal. Um, and there are other ramifications, too, which I'm sure you can think of, but those are, I think, principal ones. Egypt's going to be a real dicey business here for the next few years trying to figure out where it's going itself, and then us trying to figure out where it's going and either help or, or not. Um, I think it's fair to say that Egypt's problem in the entire region is the problem that is going to be the most difficult to solve in all these countries to a lesser degree in some than others. And that is that you have so many people who are under 40. In some cases, 70% of the population. In most cases, at least 50%. No job prospects, no family prospects because of that. What they want, basically, is what Tom Friedman said some years ago they want. They want a roof over their head. They want a prospect for or a reasonable job. They want at least two meals a day. They want clean water to drink, and they want a lasting ceasefire. That's what most of these people want, and frankly, leaders like Morsi and others are probably not going to be able to deliver that in, a, in the short term. And so this is going to be, I think, a volatile region for a, a time to come because of that. So many young people without any prospect for the future. That's also a very rich ground to recruit terrorists in. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, dear sir, please excuse me because of my language barrier. Uh, I, uh, I don't know how you want to justify shaking hands with Iran. It's not suicide for America while the radical or non-radical Islamic belief is tricking your enemy is okay in Islam. Okay, you're, I think what you said was why would we ever want to shake hands with Iran? No, no. Uh, shaking hands with Iran is okay, but, uh, but why they believe Taqiyya is one Islamic term means you can fool your enemy to win. As long as they have this policy, how come you justify shaking hands with Iran, justify is not a suicide for America? Gotcha, gotcha. I, frankly, as a diplomat or as a soldier, I don't care what the other person's sincerity is. What I care about is how good I am as a negotiator and how good I am at detecting flaws in that sincerity and how good I am at constructing an arrangement that will make that person do what I want him to do regardless of whether he's sincere or not. That's good diplomacy. Ask Teddy Roosevelt. He did it all the time. Did it with the Russians and the Japanese while they were all in the same room with him. Um, people are always duplicitous. People are always trying to get what they want and not what you want. 
That's what you train good diplomats and good presidents and good secretaries of state, I hope, to see around and through and to do. We've, you know, for 150 years, we did this quite well. We were absolutely superb at it. And one could argue we did because we were not all powerful. You know, the British were all powerful. The French were powerful. The Spanish were powerful. We weren't. So we did this really, really well. The best intelligence the United States of America ever had in its entire colonial or national history was when John Quincy Adams was an ambassador in Moscow, in The Hague, in Paris, in London, for seven plus years. We knew what Napoleon was going to do. We affected the Louisiana Purchase basically through his intelligence. We knew what the Tsar was going to do, when he was going to be on Napoleon's side, when he wasn't going to be on Napoleon. We knew everything we needed to know about the most dangerous area in the world to our interests because John Quincy Adams was overseas reporting. You couldn't find that kind of intelligence today and we spend a hundred billion dollars a year of your money to try and get it. Yes? Right. Yeah, read this. I'll, I'll, I'll address your question, but this is weighing the benefits and costs of military action against Iran. We put it out about uh, uh, maybe three months ago. And just while I'm at it, this is weighing the benefits and costs of international sanctions against Iran. And that book and this book are all signed by the same people. Let me just read some of their names to you. Yours truly is on here, way down at the bottom. Morton Abramowitz, Richard Armitage, Ellen Lapsom, Jessica Matthews, Samuel Berger, Zig Brzezinski, uh, Ambassador William Miller, Greg Newbold, Marine Lieutenant General, Nicholas Burns, Undersecretary for Political Affairs, Steve Cheney, Army Brigadier General, Sam Nunn, former Senator, Tom Pickering, Ambassador, Joseph Srinch. I could go on. Uh, everybody's down here who, in my book, would be a member of a national security elite group that I would listen to, to include General Anthony Zinni, Admiral Fox Fallon, and a host of others. And what we say in there, is it can't be done by the Israelis. You can bounce the rocks, it can't be done. It can't be done successfully for some of the things you just pointed out. Not enough tankers, not enough aircraft with the legs and the ordnance capabilities and the round the clock strike capabilities and so forth. Nukes is a different ball game. But I do think you really, really would be looking at an irrational regime in Tel Aviv if they thought they had to nuke Iran. Um, this is another problem I, I see for Israel right now. The only friend in the world in many respects that Israel has is the United States. The votes in the UN are just unbelievable. They're 183 to 2, 187 to 1. They're like the votes against our embargo on Cuba. The only people that vote with us anymore are Israel and Kiribati, or Palau, or the Federated States of Micronesia, or whatever. By the way, um, that's another problem we got big time. We need to do something about. Latin America is going away from us. Brazil, even Colombia, going away from us. And part of the reason is because of the stupid policy we have towards Cuba, the embargo on Cuba. It's nonsensical. Yes? Do you feel that if uh, Hegel is confirmed, uh, in conjunction with John Kerry, both being Vietnam veterans and gone through what they have, especially with their histories, uh, do you think that would have any sway over our policy with perhaps starting a war with Iran? I hope so, which is why I've been speaking out about Hegel's confirmation. I, I really was disappointed in my state, Senator Lindsey Graham and some others who attacked him in a way that simply was personal. 
and, and, and ad hominem and probably shouldn't have never happened. Um, I think Kerry and Hagel will give President Obama the, their best advice. And I've known Hagel for 20 years. Uh, I've known Kerry a little less time. Uh, I know that both of them are opposed to using war as the principal instrument of American power. Last resort, which Colin Powell was so adamant about when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff that we had, we had some of our most vicious fights. Not fight. You didn't fight with H.W. Bush. Uh, that, was a, that was a really rare group of people with that first Bush administration. Um, but his, his emphasis all the time was what Thucydides said that I quoted. You know, Restraint is that aspect of power that men admire most. Restraint. And it's even, I think, it's doubly incumbent on a great power to exercise restraint. One, because you've got the power and you can do it. You've got the magnanimity, if you will. You can do it. And that magnanimity, when exercised in the world, wins you all kinds of friends. And second, you have such a reserve of power that even if you err in the other instruments, you've got plenty to follow up with. And your enemies know it. So I think it's incumbent on a great power to show restraint more than to use the, the, the instrument of force. We have made it so easy for the US president to use the military that it's, it's, it's almost risible. We have no draft. We have no conscription. Less than 1% of us are serving. And it's socio, if you don't believe it's socioeconomically determined, come and let me talk to you sometime. My kids at William & Mary, my kids at George Washington University know that any soldier, sailor, airman, or marine that they accosted in the street whom they said to, I'll give you my seat, would take it in a heartbeat and be in that college. But they can't afford it, or they're not intellectually equipped, or sometimes both. And so they're in the military. That's not to degrade or deride the military. I was in it for 31 years. It's simply to state the truth of what we've allowed to happen in this country. Now, if it's what we want, if what we want is that most of our kids, most of our daughters and sons, brothers and sisters, never have to raise a hand in anger, then fine. But we need to think about what we've done to ourselves. And let me tell you something else about what we've done to ourselves in that regard. 60% of the $685 billion spent on the Defense Department last year was spent on people. Think about that. Health care is the most alarming rising cost in DOD. We used to bring people in, like when I came into the Army, who didn't have a family. About 11% of the Army was married. Over 70% is married today and with dependents, and they're all on that health care. You want to see somebody pulling his hair out like me, <laughs> you watch Chuck Hagel when he gets a handle on what really are the cost of your military. It's people, and it's because we don't have a draft. What steps would we take with Israel? What steps do you think we need to take with Israel in order to get to the table with Iran? Um, I'm very encouraged there. If there's any aspect of this that is encouraging for me at the moment, uh, Israel has just more or less said that they've changed their mind about the window of opportunity or danger. It's probably 2014 or 2015 now, which means they've thought about this a little bit and maybe got a little more rational about it politically and otherwise. So that gives us time for um, diplomacy to work if we can you know, change that diplomacy like I just indicated. Um, I think more rational voices in, in, in Tel Aviv now are holding forth because of the turmoil in the recent election. They barely won. And people are actually examining what's happening in Israel. Let, let's talk about that for just a second. In Israel, they have, in 1948 and years immediately thereafter, Israel was basically a socialist state. A lot of people don't want to admit that, but she was. Israel today has transformed itself into a country with a destroyed labor movement. 60 families have about, oh, roughly 62, 63% of the wealth. 51% of the land is occupied or owned by the security complex. 
and it's a garrison state. That's not tenable. You cannot maintain a Jewish state and a democracy under those conditions for very much longer. So if Israel doesn't do something domestically and against its immediate neighbors soon to accommodate a more peaceful environment, one that it can adjust its own domestic situation in to be more egalitarian, more liberal, more democratic, and at the same time recognize the countries around it not as enemies but as people who want to live in peace and commerce and so forth together, it isn't going to work. I, that's why I'm so frightened about Israel's future, long-term future. It really looks like it's going to be a one-state solution. It looks like that state is going to continue to be a garrison state. It looks like it's going to treat its Palestinian and Arab non-Jew, in other words, citizens like third-class citizens or worse. And it looks like it's going to become a state that the international community 20 years from now will condemn. That's no future. That's no future at all. And most of this has been brought on by this having to maintain a garrison state 24-7. You just can't do that and protect your democracy at the same time. Every founding father we had, from Thomas Pinckney to Elbridge Gerry to John Adams to James Monroe to James Madison to George Washington to Thomas Jefferson, said, said that over and over again. You cannot maintain a democratic federal republic that's a garrison state. And ladies and gentlemen, sometimes when I look around the United States, it looks like it might be headed that way. Have an attorney general who actually says to the American people that due process does not necessarily include legal process? That he can kill American citizens at will so long as they are determined to be doing something associated with terrorism? Where are we? Asleep? This is dangerous stuff. I'm on the Hill, and a congressman, a Republican congressman, says to me, you know what's working right now, Larry? What's working is an amendment to the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, that year? No, I said, what's working? He said, what's working is to eliminate posse comitatus. Oh, why? Posse comitatus hasn't been eliminated since Reconstruction in the South because we're afraid. You afraid, I said to the congressman? No, I'm not afraid. I was one of the five dissenting voices. Five out of 535 dissented, only five, allowing the armed forces to participate in domestic law enforcement on a nationwide basis, so long as you have determined that material support to terrorism is occurring? That's a recipe for tyranny. And yet, it passed in the House and in the Senate with only five dissenting voices. Where are we? Why are we letting this happen to ourselves? Could, could you get the mic? I can barely yes. hear you. Uh, I would like to comment on one of your insights uh, about the Arab Spring when um, I'm an Iraqi and I lived in the region my entire life and I'd like there, I would like to say they're deep-sided that every country in the Arab world are different, uh, is different. And there is a lot of uh, politics as well as culture and religion is involved. Like Lebanon is not like Egypt. Right. So liberating Lebanon, it won't be like liberating Egypt. And uh, another thing, you, uh, I'm a political science international relation graduate student. My question is, uh, you mentioned something about talk and negotiation. I would ask if the, these negotiations did not go as they were desired or let's say failed, what would be the next step? Thank you. Good question, excellent question. I think you only have two options really. You either live up to your rhetoric, rhetoric and you attack with the full realization that the attack has to be followed up by a ground invasion because you aren't gonna stop the program unless you do, unless of course, by some strange happening, and it could happen. I mean, the world's full of strange happenings. Your bombing topples the government. But here's a problem there, even. I don't think any government that comes to power in Iran, even a one, one that we, we call green or democratic or whatever, is going to give up the nuclear program. I just don't think they are. 
So you still got the problem of trying to figure out who's in charge and whether or not you trust them with that nuclear program. Not necessarily weapon, but program. So that's one option. The other option is what in military terms is called containment. And that's being talked about a lot inside the Beltway too, and that is you live with Iran as it is and you contain them. And you contain them essentially by uh, your own nuclear arsenal, Israel's nuclear arsenal, the Saudis, the GCC, and others constantly looking down their throat. And you, know, you move one inch out of Iran with anything that looks like a nuclear weapon and we're gonna, you're gonna take care of you. Um, those are the only two options that I see if, if negotiations fail. Colonel Wilkerson, I yes. hate to interrupt. We have time for one more question, I think, and that'll be it. Um, so if did someone have their hand raised, it's okay. fine. This gentleman right here. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate your, your talks. Uh, is it sustainable to see United States of America uh, without the morality, superiority, and just relying on economic and military power to continue to lead the world and be an example that we hope and love to think of American and American power in, in the world as we know it? With what you have seen and what you have done in Washington, what does it take to turn things around? Yeah. I think, you know, I think you put your finger on the ultimate question: is what do we want to be? What Richard Bruce Cheney wanted us to be to the world, which is a giant to be feared at all costs. We will do anything. We will kill you. We will torture you. We will murder you. We will come in in the night and slit your throat in your bed if you challenge us. That's Dick Cheney. Believe me, that's Dick Cheney. That is a, an approach to the world. It's a highly nationalistic, hyper, I, I would call it hyper fearful approach to the world. The politics of fear, the creation of fear is what protects you. I don't think there's an empire in human history that was protected by that. I don't care whether you go to the Genghis Khan or the Syrians or the Romans or anybody else. When you become that sort of element in the world, the rest of the world moves to balance you. When, when you create that kind of fear, the rest of the world moves to balance you. And for, before long, you find out that China, Brazil, Russia, India, and others have decided that they have a complementary interest in defeating the interest of the United States. So you better, by cajoling, wheedling, diplomacy, politics, finance, economics, and everything, which we do quite well, stay embedded in that world and have at least a modicum of those people who like you <laughs> rather than hate you. And as I would submit that because of who we are and because of whom I hope we still are across this great country, it's even more important for us to live up to the ideals of what we say we believe in. I think it's key. Thanks for that question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let me I want to thank Colonel Wilkerson for, uh, for being here today. Uh, for those of you that uh, have RSVP, there's going to be a, a following dinner next door. Um, I was about ready to award all of you three hours of international politics credit. <laughs> <laughs> By the time we finish this uh, amazing uh, the diverse and insightful overview of a variety of issues. And regardless of where you came from when you came through the door, I think you had more than ample food for thought uh, as you leave. Uh, you've graced us with your presence. We appreciate the work that you continue to do on behalf of this country, that you started in the military, that you went into diplomatic work, and, and now you're, you're an educator, and we appreciate it very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. <laughs>